welcome again. Uh, my name is Dick. I'm one of the pastors here at Katy First United Methodist Church. Uh, I am glad to welcome you in the name of the Lord. We're so grateful that as the church gathers each week for prayer and worship and the singing of songs that it uplifts and it fulfills our spirit. Today, uh, I am preaching the third in a series of five sermons, uh, a sermon series called Hope Rises. And in this sermon series, we are looking at uh, expanding our generosity uh, to God. If you're a guest of our church, I want you to know this is just a little housekeeping that we do annually uh, as we inspire and motivate our congregation uh, to uh, give for the ministries of this church. Uh, I want you to know we're not going to be asking money of you uh, unless, of course, you want to give some money. That's always a good thing. Uh, but we do want to say uh, that through these, um, I think, sermons and through the scripture lessons that we read, that God really does uh, have a way of expanding our hearts uh, to help others. And so I hope that you will be encouraged by these lessons. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the church of Corinth. I'll be reading from the eighth chapter, beginning at verses one through five. Uh, would you bow your heads as we pray for illumination? O most grace, great and glorious God, you have blessed us in order that we may be a blessing to others. But we ask you to bless us once more with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that as these words of scripture are read, that we may hear within them the living, breathing word of God that you intend us to hear today. For this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Paul writes, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed into a wealth of generosity on their part. Whereas I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this not merely as we expected. They gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We want you to know about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia, for in their extreme poverty, it has overflowed into a wealth of generosity, as they gave voluntarily according to their means and even beyond their means. This morning, Paul is giving a treasurer's report. He is telling the church of Corinth about the great need to help feed the saints in Jerusalem. You may recall from the book of Acts that when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and the church was born, that the believers sold everything they had and they put it all in common. It has been several years now and their expectation that the Lord Jesus would return once again had not yet been fulfilled, and the church, being in the midst of a great famine, found themselves in need. And so Paul is encouraging these Corinthians who live in a very wealthy city that they would take up an offering for the saints that are in Jerusalem. And you may recall from last week, I told you that in effect he was asking those Corinthians to give 40% of their income. And this, to me, seems impossible. 
how in the world could they in their poverty give so extravagantly? It is no doubt to me that they were good church members, they were people of faith, but quite honestly, that kind of challenge, I don't really understand. It seems beyond anything that I or you could do. But Paul isn't talking about what is impossible with God, but those things that are possible with God. So how do we give a gift that simply seems outside of our means? For most of us, we look at what we have and then we decide what we give. But Paul said, I want you to look not only to what you have, but even beyond that for this great work of God. And what Paul is talking about is extravagant generosity, that kind of irrational generosity that causes us to trust solely in God. In 1996, Alan Greenspan, who was the chair of the Federal Reserve, warned about the stock market. He said, do not be irrationally exuberant. In other words, he was talking about the stock market was overvalued, and yet people, when they saw it going up, thought it will just continue to rise and rise and rise until it didn't. In 2008, the stock market lost almost 40% of its value in about a week. It seems unlikely for me and for you to understand what it means to be irrationally exuberant for the work of God. I mean, how does that happen? It's hard for me when I look at my needs and my everyday bills and I look at my debts, how in the world am I going to make ends meet? And yet, there is a line between faith and rationality. Paul is trying to encourage those in Corinth to understand what God has already done in these churches in Macedonia. You may know that Macedonia is just north of the country of Greece, Paul had been traveling all throughout Asia Minor. He felt God's call to go over uh, to uh, the other people that were a part of Greece. And there he established all these little bitty churches. And, And I don't want you to think about this church, these great buildings and facilities. These were really very small churches, probably no more than 20 people. They met in homes for worship and praise for singing, for growing in the spirit and their knowledge of Jesus Christ. These are the kind of churches that Paul appealed to. And they opened up their hearts to the Lord. They gave everything that they had first to the Lord and then to this great work. Paul says, that in truth, they gave out of their rock-bottom poverty. In the Greek, that phrase refers to their debts. They gave, turning their debts into riches. For them, faith means having the hope and the trust that God will provide for all the needs, including those that they give away. Now, when I think about giving, uh, there are two ways that I think we give. And the first way is by reason. Uh, we just, we open up our Quicken account or you check your checkbook 
and you see how much you have and you line up all the columns of all your needs or your bills or your loans and you uh, then make all of your giving decisions uh, according to what you have. Does this sound familiar? Do any of you look at your checkbook? That's what I want to know. Of course we do. And if we are prudent, we try not to overspend or to go into debt, and though sometimes we do. But instead, that kind of giving, uh, this rational giving, really doesn't require very much from us. In fact, you don't even have to be a believer to give in that way. But what Paul is appealing to uh, the Corinthians holding up the Macedonian churches is not about rational giving, but it is about giving irrationally in an extravagant way. He is calling upon them to make a gift, trusting that if they step out this way, that God will help make that gift possible. It is not so much transactional. In other words, God, if I do this, you're going to do that. But rather, <clears throat> it is transactional. In other words, it is above reason itself. Certainly, Jesus understood this. <clears throat> In Matthew's gospel, you may remember the story that Jesus is having uh, dinner one evening in the house of a Pharisee, and a woman enters into that house off the streets, and she approaches Jesus, who is reclining at the table. She opens up a alabaster jar of perfume, and she anoints the head of Jesus, and immediately the disciples they begin to grumble. Why this waste? Why this could have been sold and the money could have been used to help the poor. Why this extravagance? But Jesus tells them, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. She has done <clears throat> a beautiful thing for me. In fact, she has prepared me for my burial. You see, when we uh, offer to God our very best, when we offer that kind of gift that is, uh, it makes no sense, it could have been sold to help the poor, but instead, Jesus says, when you're doing it to me, it is a unique thing and a beautiful thing. There's nothing quite like giving the gift of love. I heard this story about a businessman who traveled quite a bit, and whenever he was about to travel, he would go to the bank, and he would get a, a large uh, wad of $50 bills. And before he would leave, he, he would pray that God would nudge him in some way in which he would know what to do with that money. And so he said when he was checking out of his hotel, he remembered that the housekeepers that cleaned his room only made minimum wage. And so he took out two $50 bills and he laid them on the table because he knew that they could use it. When he checked into another hotel, there was a little stand there. Uh, it was for getting your shoes shined. And he thought, you know, I better get my shoes shined. And so he sat down in the chair and the man began to clean and to polish his shoes. As they struck up the conversation, he told him that he was from Mexico. He had only arrived three days earlier and that he was, had a visa, a visa, a work visa, to stay there for six months and that he had come in the hope of trying to make enough money that he could send some back to his wife and to his children. And after he had finished, 
this businessman got down from the chair and he said, he said to him, because you're just starting out, I want you to know that most people won't do this. But he pulled out six $50 bills and he gave it to him. Now, why would he do that? Why would he give $300 for a $10 shoe shine? Except that he knew that God had blessed him to be a blessing to others. And so he gave from the heart as an expression of love. He gave because he believed he was actually giving to Jesus. And even though it may not make economic sense, it makes sense in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love and of light, where we are called to be our brothers and sisters keeper. That's why in the Bible we see two kinds of giving, rational giving that makes sense and this irrational, exuberant gift that is used by God. And when we do that, hope rises. <clears throat> Excuse me. I read a story about a young couple that was um, trying to become pregnant. And they had tried for many years. They'd been married almost eight years. And for the last three of those years, uh, they simply couldn't have a baby. And so they had gone to the uh, fertility clinic. Some of you may have firsthand knowledge of this or experience or maybe someone in your family or friends. And they began to go through all the treatments, you know, get the hormone shots, uh, have some procedures. And every month there was that hope that this would be the month that they would be pregnant. But every month, they went home brokenhearted and disappointed. Month after month, year after year. There was no pregnancy. There was no baby. In them, you could sense that sadness that was brought about by pain. But some months later, their friends reported that there was something different about this couple, that their countenance had changed. In fact, they even appeared joyful. And when they were asked what happened, their friends learned that they uh, were not able to have a baby, but that God had led them to help another couple that they had met there. This couple had also been trying for many years, but had made the decision that they would adopt a child. And if you know anything about adoptions these days, they can range up to $20,000. They're quite expensive. But this couple would determine that they would help financially this couple to adopt a baby. And I wonder why they would do that. Why would they take the money that they had and give it away, except they found a joy in another couple having a child? That they found this kind of irrational generosity that doesn't make sense to most of the world. It may not even make sense to us except that they felt the leading of God, knowing that they had been blessed and they wanted to be a blessing. And I find that remarkable. And I find it inspirational. Friends, there may be a moment in your life where you feel the call of God to do something that other people might caution you about. Do you really want to do this? Do you, you really want to give that much? And you may want to think about, in this time, 
What is it that I feel that God is calling me to give to the ministry of this church so that we can keep expanding those ministries into our community, into our families, and into this congregation? You see, hope isn't a matter of economic advantage, but rather hope is about love that is shared. Friends, hope rises here because of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.